Amen. Well, tonight we want to talk on uh, putting God first. How many know that's a pretty important subject, to put God first? And many times uh, people don't know what that means. That, um, you know, they, they can be born again and come into the kingdom of God, but there is a lot of learning that needs to be done. Amen. There's a lot of growing spiritually, and that's why the church needs to be tight-knit. It needs to be on, on point, and we uh, work together to grow these um, souls up spiritually. Not only them, but ourselves. How many know that we are to keep growing? We are to keep be allowing God to put us in challenging positions and, and then trusting him and, and doing more than we thought we could ever do by the power of God. There's no greater feeling than that. Amen. You know, they, they say, there's a saying that says high risk, high reward. <laughs> you know, the devil takes a chance whenever he tries to keep you down and, and hurts you and hinder you. Because when you trust God, you're stronger than you ever were. You're stronger and, and, and you see things more clearly. And, you know, we just keep taking those levels, those steps, until the Lord comes back. But we are to always put God first. So if you put God first, He will direct your path. That's a good thing, right? That's, that's what um, Proverbs 3, 6 says. If you put God first, he, he will give you the desires of your heart. That's Psalms 37, 4. If you put God first, Jesus said, all these things will be added unto you. That's Matthew 6, 33. So when we put God first, in the happy moments, we praise God. In the difficult moments, we seek God. In the quiet moments, we will worship God. In every moment, we will thank God. In every moment. You know, the Bible says that in all things, we are to thank the Lord. Always be thankful. The Bible doesn't say to thank God for every circumstance that comes into your life. Because don't thank him for something that he didn't bring, right? If it's killing, stealing, and destroying, don't thank him for it, right? <laughs> he didn't have anything to do with it. But what the, what the Apostle Paul was saying is, look, if you let challenging circumstances steal your joy and steal your thankfulness, you're basically... Um, you're, you're um, limited. So we always, always keep a thankful heart. Don't let the devil take that out, out of your life, right? Now, uh, Sister Sonona put on Facebook uh, something that the Lord gave her in uh, prayer. And um, this is the Lord speaking. And he says, when you spend precious moments with me, I compensate you generously. I clarify your thinking and smooth out, smooth out the circumstances of your life, says the Lord. Isn't that wonderful? That's the Lord speaking to her in prayer. I mean, if Sonona can do it, we all can do it, right? <laughs> all we need to do is spend time in God's presence. See, if you put God first, that means you go to him first when you have a problem. Not second, not third. But I want to read that again. The Lord said, when you spend precious moments with me, I compensate you generously. I clarify your thinking and smooth out the circumstances of your life, says the Lord. How many of us can say we've been there and we've experienced that? You know, life, um, life can be difficult and it can be challenging. and um, Not can, it is. <laughs> and it will be, right? But what's that compared to the joy that's in us and the strength that's in us and the vision and the, and the passion that God brings us that we just break through every barrier because we know our God and we know that our life matters. If, if, you, if you want to follow along, look at Proverbs 14, 12. This is New King James. I want to show you just a simple scripture here. And so we're just going to um, move right through and, and uh, continue on the subject of putting God first there's a lot of people that will say they are putting God first, but you sort of look at them and, and see their, what, what they're doing and, and it doesn't add up, right? It's pretty easy to see if somebody's putting God first. That means they lay themselves down. And, and it's not I, but Christ that lives within me. Not my will, but your will be done. And um, so we don't want to be in a state where we are doing things contrary to the word of God and outside of the spirit, but yet feeling and believing that we're putting God first. That's a tough place to be. Amen. 
That's why we have to be sensitive to the Holy Spirit. We have to be sensitive to the Word of God. The Holy Spirit and the Word agree. They work together, right? And then we have to be sensitive to the people that God puts in our lives. The, the Bible says there's wisdom in the counsel of many. Not one person figures it all out. You know, I've been a pastor now for uh, 19 years, and there's been several times in my life where I needed to talk to someone, and I have certain people in my life that I can talk to. I needed to go and talk to them, and just by talking to them, it lifted, it lifted that oppression that was on me. I've had that happen um, a few many times, and so that's because I knew what to do, right? I knew that there, like I said, there's wisdom in the counsel of many. I know that God's in them just like he is in me. And, but you have to find who are those people in your life that are spiritual? Who are those people in your life that will tell you what you need to hear, not what you want to hear? And then um, just use that avenue. But look at Proverbs 14, 12. It says, there is a way that seems right to a man, but its end is the way of death. That way is still out there. In 2022, there is a way out there that seems right to man, but it ends in death. Now, death doesn't show itself on the beginning of the journey, does it? But you're on your way. The Bible says to death if you're on the way that seems right to man and off the way of God. We don't want to be on that path. Amen? The Passion Bible says this. It says, you can rationalize it all you want and justify the path you have chosen, but you will find out in the end that you took the road to destruction. It's my job as a pastor to help keep you off that road. Amen? And that's what I endeavor to do. And if I have to tell you something that you don't want to hear at the moment, I'll just take a chance and believe that you love me and you'll forgive me if you get mad at me. But I'm not going to sit back and watch you take a wrong road. And uh, I'm going to try to do what I can to help. And so look at Proverbs 14, 14. It says, The backslider in heart will be filled with his own ways, but a good man will be satisfied from above. The Passion Bible says, Those who turn from the truth get what they deserve, but a good person receives a sweet reward. You know the Bible says that godliness is profitable? The last time I checked, the fruit of the Spirit are pretty good. Pretty good things. Peace and love and joy. Now, all these things, they're, they're, they're fruit that come into our life as we sow to the Spirit, as we spend time in God's presence, and we have an understanding that He is to be first in our life. And, and we, we go towards that, that mark in, in everything that we do. We're not going to get it right all the time. God didn't ask you to get it right all the time. He did ask you to be right in your heart, though. Amen. Amen. That's what he told, um, he told Abraham. He said, walk before me and be thou perfect. Remember that when he came on the scene? And, and you might say, be perfect. Well, we know Abraham wasn't perfect. We can pick him apart all day long. What he was talking about I want, he, you know, he also said, I don't want you to have any other God before me. And I want you to keep your heart right. I want you to trust me. I want you to believe me. I want you to follow my instructions. And, and, I'll, and I'll enter into this covenant with you. And of course, Abraham said, okay, I'll, <laughs> I'll do it, right? Did, did, he, did he profit from that? And so um, we have a saying in the church. been saying it for quite some time. Bring them in, build them up, and make them wise. And so bring them in means that we are laborers for the harvest. The angels aren't the laborers for the harvest. We are. We're to go out and, and bring them in and invite people to church and to love on them and to show them the love of God. 2,000 years ago, Jesus said the harvest is ready and ready to go, white and ready to go. And he said that the harvest is plenteous, but the laborers are few. I wonder sometimes at this, this tech, technological age that we live in, it's easy to sit behind the keyboards. And, and sometimes I'm, I'm a keyboard warrior on Facebook and I'll put a lot of stuff because it's, 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 
going out there, I'm going to spread the word. But you know what? Nothing can ever replace the, the going out one-on-one and talking to people face-to-face. Amen? And, and to attempt to bring them in. They need a church. The people of the world need a church. Those children need a church. Those, those children out there, they need, a, they need a, a, a spiritual family. They need to be taught the word. They need to find a place that's loving and kind and, and a place that's safe for them to grow. I believe we are that place. Amen? I believe we are that kind of a place for the Lord. But we got to bring them in. One Sunday, maybe I'll issue a challenge and say, who can bring the most people the next Sunday? I know some churches do that, right? There, there was a guy in church a while ago. He was a good guy. He, he was on fire for the Lord, and he, uh, he invited like um, 21 people to church one week, and none of them came. And I said, that's all right, brother. You invited them. That's the main thing. You know, I hope, I didn't get a chance to talk to him after that, but I hope that that not having 21 people come that he invited, I hope that didn't discourage him. Can you make anybody come? Can you tie them up in the back of your car? That's kidnapping. <laughs> you know, can, can you, all you can do is speak the word and believe that the anointing's with the word. And, and you show them love. Jesus was rejected many times. But you will, if you keep asking people, they will come. They will come. And they'll find a home. We just got to be bold in these last days. And so we bring them in and then we build them up. What's that mean? The first thing we do is we show them their worth. We show them the love of God. We show them how to go boldly to the throne of grace. We get them filled with the Spirit and teach them how to fellowship with the Holy Spirit. That's how you build them up. Amen? I love to tell a, a young Christian that you're just as much a child of God as I am. I love to tell a young Christian that, that I'm no more righteous than you are. My righteousness is of God in Christ Jesus. So is theirs. If they're a born again believer, right? You can't be more righteous, can you? You can grow in that righteousness and you can grow in grace and, and, and honor God with your life and bear tremendous fruit, but the righteous part comes from believing in Jesus Christ. And when they come into the kingdom of God, they're a child of God just like us. That's how you build someone up. They need it, don't they, a lot of times. And so we show them their worth, get them filled with the Spirit. Oh, how sweet it is to pray in the Spirit. You can't beat that. You can't beat that experience. That's a way to get away. Amen? And then we make them wise. We teach them to put God first. You have to teach people how to do that. And if they put God first, they're going to be living a life of faith. That's what they're going to learn to do. Honor the word above all. We have to honor the word, right? We teach them to serve God with the right heart. That's important. They always got to guard their heart, keep their heart right, and we teach them the ways of the Bible. Remember, there's a way that seems right. They've been on that road. It led them nowhere. Now we're talking the, the road of righteousness, the road of the Word and the Spirit, the road to growing and developing in our walk with God. What did Jesus say when, when he washed the disciples' feet? He said they should do the same. So literally what Jesus was saying is this. This is a God way. This is the word way. This is the spirit way. He was saying the way up in the kingdom of God is down. So you stay humble and you serve and you, and you take care of one another. That'll keep pride out. Pride tries to sneak in there, doesn't it? We're to teach them how to love their God. We're to teach them how to love their family how to love their church, and how to love the lost. We're to teach them how to forgive and to, here's a big one, how to forgive, but also how to receive forgiveness. I think that's often overlooked. A lot of times people don't know how to receive that forgiveness because the devil keeps uh, pounding them in their minds about their, their, um, their failures, 
And so we have to, we teach them that if they are born again in the spirit, they're a new creation. Amen. The old man's gone. They're a new person in Christ. And God doesn't deal with them according to that way. He deals with them with love and grace and mercy. And besides, if they're not perfect, we say, welcome to the family. Welcome to the club. <laughs> We have to remember in this building them up and making them wise, when newer people come into the church, they think you're all super Christians. They think you just, you're just always that way. We need to show them, no, we're just like them, except we're a little further along, right? We've been at it a little longer, but, but we're no better than they are. So when Jesus washed the disciples' feet, that was a precious, precious moment, wasn't it? So we're to teach them about the name of Jesus. All our power is in the name of Jesus. That's the name above all names, right? We're to teach them how to live victoriously. We're to teach them how to move mountains. We're to teach them how to resist the devil and then how to follow God's will for their life. We have a lot to do. And I don't understand sometimes when people say, you know, I don't have nothing to do in my church. What do you mean you don't have nothing to do? You got a lot of people that you, you can pray for. You got a lot of people that you can build relationships with. I mean, you don't need a title or an office to be productive in the church. You just need to have a willing heart to do so. Now, as a pastor, I've always had a tender heart. And so what that means is if someone's giving a word or preaching or saying something, I look for the words to be right, but I look deeper than that. I look at the heart that it's coming out of. I look at the spirit behind it. And, and, I, and I look for things like pride or things like things that aren't quite meshing with, with the, the way of the Holy Spirit. And then these are the things that I, um, I try to work on people with. Do you think that people can sing for God, and sing in the church but not sing for God? Do you think people can serve in the church but not really have God in mind much? So who, who is uh, the one that helps them along their merry way? <laughs> and, uh, um, we are, right? I'll never forget, um, I, I, I thought about Sister Denise when I was giving this, writing this message up in her trip, missions trip. And uh, she was so nervous about um, speaking in front of the church. Remember that, Sister? And... Uh, <laughs> But man, she sought the Lord. She spoke the least amount of time. It, it might not even have been as long as the Gettysburg Address, three and a half minutes. But what she said, I remember today. I remember today. And when she said it, it, it impacted me. And, it, and, it, and it's still in my life today. It's part of my, my spiritual reasoning. In, in my way that I keep myself on the right path because we can all fall off the, the path if we're not careful. And the first thing the Lord said, or one of the things he said, I'm not sure what order it was, he said, you're putting too much of yourself into it. Amen. Sometimes we worry about not looking good or um, failing or what people think about us. That's putting way too much of yourself in that. Way too much. You do it for God, right? And then the Lord told her, he said, there's good things outside of the box, but you have to go out there and get them. No one can bring them in. That really hit me. That really hit home. There's a lot of Christians, they're not happy and they're not fulfilled because they've confined themselves to a box of some sort of comfortability and they know those things are out there and they see other people enjoying those things, but they don't want to go out themselves. And so, if you're not willing to go out, don't complain for what you get. God likes to get you out of the box. Hey, God is nice. He's merciful. He's kind. He's loving. He's patient. But one thing he is not, he is not an enabler. He will not feel sorry for you and be wishy-washy with you. If you want to walk with the Lord... Pay very close attention to what the Holy Spirit says and do it. It's going to cost you some things, right? I want to read to you what, uh, you don't have to turn there, but what the Passion Bible says in Luke 34, 8. 
It says, drink deeply of the pleasures of God. Experience for yourselves the joyous mercies he gives to all who turn to hide themselves in him. So we have to deep, drink deeply from, from the pleasures of God. And you have to experience it for yourself. There are certain things that we can experience together, but yet there are certain things that you need to experience, you and God. Amen? And that all comes with putting God first. And so the most <coughs> difficult <coughs> group of Christians are those that have never submitted and have never bowed down. They've never been softened. Everything that happens, everything that they do, everything ha that happens is to gratify their own heart. And they're tough, tough to work with. Um, one thing, like I said, uh, before, I've been transparent in my journey here. There's a lot of things I had to fight for, I had to work for. And some, I'm not even embarrassed anymore to tell you some of the things that I had to go through and learn. Because you know what, that was just me. But there are things that I had from the get-go. There are things that, that I didn't have to um, work at. And this is one of them, <laughs> you know. Um, I've always known how to be submissive and to bow my knee to God. And I, I believe that's one of the reasons why, even though I didn't have a lot of uh, experience, I believe that God could get me there because my heart was right. And he could, he could use me um, in that way. But if Christians haven't submitted or bowed their knee, not to me, I'm not the king here. <laughs> right? Who are they bowing their knee to? God. So what... What are they basing their bowing their knee to God? The Word of God. Amen? They hear what the Word says, and they, they um, yield to it, and they bow their knee to it because their flesh and their emotions and those parts of their bodies are going to want to go the opposite way, and they're going to want to cause trouble. We all have to go through it, don't we? And so sometimes... Those that have never submitted or never bowed down to the, to the lordship of God or, or never come to this place, Lord, not my will, but your will be done. You know how many uh, times in, in 19 years that I've been discouraged? A lot. <laughs> Just in case you're wondering. <laughs> and, uh, um, but you know why I kept going? Because I do it for God. Amen? And what's it matter if I got discouraged or, or if I got knocked down or what people say? If I'm working for God, I work for God. Do you ever realize how sometimes people, when they get angry at the world or what someone's done, the first thing they do is take it out on God? I'm like, why are you taking it out on God? He didn't do anything. They get angry or frustrated, and the first thing they say, I'm not going to church no more. Well, Why? God said go to church. Did he say go to church? Some people can't endure the tiniest bit of frustration. You know that such people have received little grace and cannot commit any, you cannot commit any uh, church uh, affair to them. They're, it would be a novice, right? What did Paul, Paul say? Don't put a novice in office. Because what happens? They can be lifted up with pride. That's where the devil wants to get you. If he can get you up in pride. You say Christians, Christians can get full of pride? All, I can't believe you had to ask me that question. All the time. All the time. We all have to battle that one. Uh-oh. There's different forms of pride. I'll never forget, I, like I said, the Lord was leading me and guiding me, and I, I was like, Lord, not my will, but your will. And I was struggling getting up here and preaching. And um, the Lord said that, uh, he said to me, he said, you have too much pride. Like, pride, me? And, and I, I was thinking of pride on the one side of pride where some people think they're better than others. That wasn't me. They're arrogant, and they think that that's just, they're just way above other people, and 
Usually the person in that type of pride are the last, one to, last ones to see it in themselves. But he wasn't talking. He said there's another pride. This is the Holy Spirit. I'm telling you, if you follow him and have a good heart, he's going to speak to you. He's going to, just like he did Sister Denise. He's going to speak to you, and it's probably not going to be audibly. It could be, but God prefers to speak to you inwardly. That's why he put his spirit in there. That's why we have to stay softened. And he said, no, you got the other pride that you're afraid to fail. You're afraid of what you're going to look like, and you're afraid to be embarrassed. That's a form of pride, isn't it? I said, what did I say? All right, God, I'm not going to be afraid of that anymore. I'm going to just do what you called me to do and put you first. I mean, you've got to put God first or everything breaks down. I've told this story before, but when I was at Ramah, um, they liked to put me outside when I was ushering because I was from Pennsylvania. They said he's, he's, from, he, he's used to the cold. I didn't mind because I like being by myself. <laughs> and, uh, um, but I was out there one day, freezing cold on the back door. I bet you maybe three people came through. I didn't mind it. I was, I was in my glory. I was just out there talking to the Lord and, and praising him. And, and it started to hit me about the journey that I was on. All along, it would hit me in waves about what God was doing in my life. Sometimes I'd wake up at Ramah and I'd, I'd be like, am I really here? What happened? God happened. But I was out there and I was just so full of it. And I, I, said, I said, I was saying, people first. People first. People first. I just kept saying that. And the Holy Spirit spoke up into my heart. And he said, no, it's God first. And I realized that if, if you try to be a pastor and you put people first, you're not putting God first, are you? And you're going to be in a world of hurt. <laughs> and so that's for anybody in life. And so he'll teach us the lesson. It's up to us to learn them. But the pride can be a terrible trap of the devil. He loves to get people in pride. And did God say he would give you pastors after his own heart? that would need, lead you and nurture you and help you. Pastors are, are to be keen to see when pride's coming and to help a person get out of pride. Sometimes they listen, sometimes they don't. But you know what? We have to be obedient and give them a chance anyhow. The Bible says that the devil will lift them up. He'll lift them up in pride, and then he'll pick them off. I was watching a show one day about these guys that were hunting uh, bears at night, tracking them with dogs. And uh, they, got these, they got this uh, one bear up in the tree. And they were chasing him down, and, and uh, they had the spotlight on him. But the bear had his head tucked down, and they couldn't quite get a shot on the bear. And, and, and the guy was saying, come on, lift your head up. Lift your head up. He's talking to the bear. But the bear can't hear him. But he's like, we can hear him. He said, lift your head up. I just need you to lift your head up to get a shot. That's what the devil says. Keep getting in pride. Keep lifting yourself up. Keep validating your own feelings over the feelings of others and God. And keep doing these things. And the devil says, I'll pick you off. Pride comes before the fall, right? And so sometimes... People um, have these issues. And remember what we're talking about tonight. We've got to put God first. You've got to put God first in your marriage. He has to be first. Why would you want to put that kind of pressure on your spouse to give you what only God can give you? It doesn't make any sense, does it? You put God first and you get yours from him and you fellowship with him and get your blessing, get spiritually built up. Then you can be a better husband. You can be a better wife and you can be a better father and a better mother. But it all comes from God first. There was a pastor I heard one time. He said he was hiring an assistant pastor. And um, he, he did this to all, all the people that he was um, interviewing. He would deliberately be a couple hours late to the meeting. And he said he did that to see how the people would handle that adversity. <laughs> you know, it's pretty irritating if somebody's two hours late. And he would just watch and see how pleasant they were, or if they, if they got angry or got upset, they were out. 
He wanted to see how much control they had over, over their emotions. I've never done that. <laughs> and so, so let me just say this. If you're going to put God first, it's going to be hard on your emotions. See, worldly people live their lives, and what we've been taught in the world, we're taught to live to validate our feelings. That's not God's way. Amen? He is going to really, really work on the emotions because it's the emotions that get us sidetracked many times, is it not? And so, you know, the, the spirit, soul, and body. And so the, the soul is the mind and the will and the emotions. It's important as believers that we have a spirit-controlled soul. The, the spirit of God within us controls our soul, controls us in every way. Now, the mind is the most active part of the soul. Did you ever hear say someone has an overactive mind? It used to be, our minds used to be like a wild horse. Now it's being restrained by the will. Amen? Maybe I'm the only one. The will is to be in co- cooperation with the, with the spirit. That's to, how, that's to be the balance of it all. Now, the emotions of a person is often the lowest and uh, most unreasonable part of the soul. The emotion, but it, the emotion will exert the greatest power in swaying the will. That's where people get a little bit off charts. <laughs> the emotion is often attached to the will, and the will will usually agree with the emotion. That's why we need to keep the emotions in check, right? by a spirit-controlled will. You're going to have emotions on your journey of putting God first. Does the Bible say be angry and sin not? That means you're gonna get angry. You know, the Bible challenges us on, on a lot of these different things. These emotions are gonna come, and, but we don't live to validate our emotions, do we? If someone's mistreating me or, or, or you, or you're not to live by that lower nature and that emotion to try to get back at them or to try to do this or that. No, you're to live for God. If you trust God, he'll work things out. The problem is we try to do it. How can he work things out if you're trying to work it out? It takes some cooperation here. You cooperating with God. <laughs> you cooperating with the word of God. You cooperating with the Spirit of God. You cooperating with the spiritual leadership that God's placed in your life. You got to do it. Did you ever work with someone that you're like at a team project and it just didn't work with the team? I have. When I was at the tree service, first job I ever did was up on uh, the mountain going down before you go down to uh, McConnellsburg. And there's an FAA tower up there. And when they bid that job, they, they uh, misbid it because they didn't go behind the tower. And behind the tower was nothing but rocks. So they just bid it so you could just drive up to the trees and cut them down and chip it. It was like the wild, wild west back there. It was crazy. And it takes time to cut trees down on boulders and drag them across boulders and things like that. One day, um, they said, we've we got you a guy with some experience. He's, he's good with the chainsaws. And I said, all right, I could use some experience. And, you know, it's maybe five of us have five-man crew. So this guy, he comes, he, he comes to help. And the first day, I thought, well, I didn't know anything about him. I said, I, said, I laid out the game plan. I said, okay, I'm going to take my saw and cut here. And I'm going to drop the trees this way, and then we'll, we'll gather together and we'll chip, a, chip all the brush. And you go over here, and you cut the trees this way, flip the butts of the tree, and then we'll, we'll just have like an assembly line. We'll just go right through. Sounds like a good plan to me, right? So we're cutting away, and then all of a sudden I look up. This guy's nowhere near where I told him to be. And, and so I had to put my saw down. And I said, hey, what happened to the game plan? You're supposed to be here, cutting this way. And then we'll do this. He said, oh, yeah, okay, okay. So, all right, good, we got it. So I go back to cutting again and and, uh, doing my thing, and I look up again. He's wandering off again and taking the guys with him. All day long, it was that. 
And he had experience, but he wasn't doing me no good. And then the next, the next day, that, this guy was off and they sent me someone that never did any tree work before. I got more done that day because he was willing to cooperate. Well, how, how do you think that'll be in a church? What, bring them in, build them up, make them wise? Be, be one working body, functioning together? Do you think it could cause some havoc or some problems if someone's working against the grain? Working against the leadership, validating their own feelings, not submitting to the will of God, not their, their mind is, is sort of not even in tune with the word of God. It can be a lot of problems. But this is much bigger than trees. This is souls in the balance. Amen? And so there's a lot of discipline that comes in with serving the Lord. And so the emotions are the lowest, most unreasonable part of the soul, yet it has the greatest power on our will. You can look at a, um, a young baby. They show a lot of emotion, don't they? they, they got, they're all raw flesh when they're first born. They want that bottle. If you take the bottle out, are they happy? No. Are they, I'm willing to wait until <laughs> you give me my bottle back. It's the purest form of, of flesh, innocent flesh, but it's just the nature of the flesh. They'll cry and they'll scream and they don't care who hears them. And then a parent usually says, give them the bottle back, <laughs> right? A lot of, a lot of um, people, adults act like that. So remember, most often, the entire life of a person is controlled by their emotions. And it's what it, what it likes or, or seeks after. Is that what the world's run by, their emotions? That's why these groups out there that try to divide the country and try to like exploit social issues, they know exactly what they're doing. They're hitting people in their emotions. They're getting them all caught up and all um, burdened down in these, all these types of feelings. And then, they, then they, they trap their minds and then they're going that direction. And they're just like robots just doing their will, their bidding. We're not to be like that, are we? And like I said, I could speak from existence because from, from um, experience, there's many times that my emotions did not want to do what God wanted me to do. Am I the only one? But I understood. If I want to put God first, I have to have, to have line my will my will up with God's will. You can do that as a born again believer because you have the spirit of God in you. The world can't do that. They're not born again. You are. You're born of the spirit. You can very much be so in tune with the Holy Spirit and receive strength and, and, and the ability to, to dominate your own will and to dominate your own emotions. Jesus battled with that, did he not? He never sinned, but what did he say in the Garden of Eden? Or the Garden of Gethsemane? If this cup could pass, let it pass. But what did he end up saying? Nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. He, he showed a lot of strength. And so, if the emotions can come under the control of the spirit and we discipline it that way, now our emotions cannot act independently as it wishes like it used to, can it? We're not free to just do what we feel because what you feel might not be good, right? And so now our emotions has to yield to God's permission. We have to get permission from God to act on emotions. And if the emotions aren't lining up with the word of God, we gotta do something about it, right? So a spirit-controlled will um, will incline towards God's will. It unites with God's will, it seeks after him, and it's able to rise above its own emotion and its own reasoning. A submissive will places God, um, places a, a great emphasis on, on God, what does your will say? Not my will, but your will be done. So where do we find God's will? From his word. 
from his word. And so the Bible says, how will they know unless someone tells them? How will they be able to um, do what God says unless they, they, have the, they don't have the game plan? That's where it comes from with us, right? If people come into the church and they're not understanding the, the, the uh, way of the Lord and the way of the church, it's not going to be pretty. There's going to be a lot of people that are affected negatively. I wanted to read to you here um, in Psalms 34. This is going to be the Passion, so you can either um, just listen to it or try to follow along. But I like what the Passion Bible says. So I've experienced a lot of times people, when they're growing up spiritually and they're learning to follow God, they get down on themselves for getting angry. The Bible doesn't say get down on yourself for getting angry. It says go to God and get it dealt with. You know, they, they get down on themselves for um, all these thoughts and these emotions that they used to have. They're going to keep coming around until you, you, you take authority over them. Ask me how I know. And so Psalms 34, I love this, uh, this Passion Bible rendition. Uh, verse 1, it says, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. But let me get over to the Passion because this is where I'm supposed to be. He says, Lord, I am bursting with joy over what you've done for me. My lips are full of perpetual praise. I'm boasting of you and all your works. So let all who are discouraged take heart. Join me, everyone. Let's praise the Lord together. Let's make him famous. Let's make his name glorious to all. Listen to my testimony. I cried to God in my distress, and he answered me. He freed me from all of my fears. Gaze upon him, join your life with his, and joy will come. Your face will glisten with glory. You'll never wear that shame face again. Isn't that a good one? The devil loves to put people in shame, yes. right? The, the job of the church is to lift people out of shame and lift them into the glory of God. And the only way they're going to get there is if they can accurately see in the Word what the Word says and actually, actually find themselves in who they are in Christ and find their worth and their value. Look at verse 6. When I had nothing, desperate and defeated, I cried out to the Lord, and He heard me, bringing His miracle deliverance when I needed it most. The angel of Yahweh stooped down to listen as I prayed, encircling me, empowering me, and showing me how to escape. He will do this for everyone who fears God. Drink deeply of the pleasures of this God. Experience for yourselves the joyous mercy he gives to all who turn to hide themselves in him. Worship in awe and wonder all who've been made holy. For all who fear him will feast with plenty. Even the strong and the wealthy grow weak and hungry, but those who passionately pursue the Lord will never lack any good thing. We come behind in no good thing. Amen? Verse 11, Come, children of God, and listen to me. I'll share the lesson I've learned of fearing the Lord. Do you want to live a long, good life, enjoying the beauty that fills each day? Then never speak a lie or allow wicked words to come from your mouth. Keep turning your back on every sin and make peace your life motto. Practice being at peace with everyone. The Lord sees all that we do. He watches over his friends day and night. His godly ones receive the answers they seek whenever they cry out to him. Verse 16. But the Lord has made up his mind to oppose evildoers and to wipe out, every, out even the memory of them from the face of the earth. 
Yet when holy lovers of God cry out to him with all their hearts, the Lord will hear them and come to rescue them from all of their troubles. That's one verse that I particularly cling to right there. Amen? You know, so many times when we face battles in life, we want to get into pride. The Bible clear, does the Bible say that God resists the proud? And I often think, I don't want God to resist me. That would be terrible. Didn't say that he wouldn't love me. Didn't say that he would scratch my name out of the Lamb's book of life, but yet there would be a resistance because I would be validating my feelings instead of being obedient to the word of God. All right, you gotta watch those feelings. I'm not the only one. <laughs> there, there have been times in the church uh, sometimes you don't know what you have to deal with until you're in situations, but I did find out one thing about me that um, I didn't like it when, when people would criticize certain things or say things um, about the church or maybe even uh, certain things in front of other people, you know, and, and just try to stir up trouble and things. And um, I had to battle with uh, immediately my emotions wanted to spout out something. And it usually wasn't good. But I, I would control my emotions and control my will with the Spirit of God in me. I would feel it right in here. And I would fear the Lord, hear the Lord and fear, feel the Lord saying, don't say that. Don't say that. He, you know what he would say to me? Look where you're at. And if you say it now, all these people are going to hear it. Don't say that. Let it go. And um, so I, I would. And then when I would get home... I was, I'd be like, oh, thank you, God, I didn't say that. I had a good comeback, too. Sometimes if you have a good comeback, you're going to have to let it rest. <laughs> because it could be too good of a comeback. Right? And I'm being transparent. And I'm a, I'm a pastor, and I've been at this a long time. And I'm telling you, every day of my life, my lower nature emotions want to rise up and do something. They want to act the fool, as they might say. <laughs> How about when you're in traffic? Uh-oh, I'll leave that one alone, sorry. <laughs> but do you want to put God first? These are practical ways to do it. You know, what greater way to prove the power of God in you and the power of God in your life when you can control that? It shows yourself, doesn't it, that the power of God is working in you. Don't resign yourself to the fact that well, I'm just an angry person. I just have a temper. Oh, really? So what you're saying is that, is that your feelings are just going to dominate you? I wouldn't let them dominate you one second. You're living for God. Amen? But let me try to balance everything out. It's not, you're going to get angry, you're going to have these feelings, but it's not the feelings that are the, the problem. It's what you do with them. Amen? And sometimes in our own relationship, our spouse gets the blunt of it. I'll just talk for myself. <laughs> because when you're at home, you're more loosey-goosey. Right? Sometimes when you're out and about, you're more prim and popper, proper. And then all of a sudden, when you go inside your doors of your home, you're like, not you, other people. They're like a different person. I can take the filter off my mouth now. No, you can't. I can let my feelings go now. No, you can't. Seek God first always. Discipline that. Let the Spirit of God within you control your own will, control those emotions. Because words are powerful. I remember Joyce Myers telling a story when she first started teaching the Bible lessons at the church. There was a couple ladies at the church that didn't like her. Imagine that. And they give her a hard time. And... Um, I'm a real hard time. Say things about her. That'd be hurtful, wouldn't it? But she kept talking to the Lord, and the Lord said, just keep doing what I called you to do. Just keep doing it. And finally, um, the Lord told her this. 
He said, stop talking about it. Stop talking about it. Let me take care of it. And so she's laying in bed that night and, and she starts telling Dave about it all. And the Lord said, that includes Dave too, her husband. Stop talking to him too. And she said, do you think it was the hardest thing in the world to do? When you really want to say something and you really been done wrong and he doesn't even want you to say it to your husband? Well, do you want to start working in power? Control that one. The Bible says if you bridle the tongue, you can bridle the whole man. The Holy Spirit tames the tongue. But let me balance you out here. I'm not saying never talk to your husband <laughs> about things, right? I'm not saying never communicate because you need to communicate and you need to bounce things across. But sometimes you just got to be quiet because you're doing no one any good. Not you people, people in there. <laughs> so you know what I call this message tonight? A pastor message. Amen? I want you to grow. I want you to develop. I want you to, to get the best out of what God has for you. I try to live my life non-threatening. I try to be kind and patient and pr pray that I'm someone that you can receive from. I'm not trying to get in your business. I'm just trying to tell you what the Holy Spirit told me to tell you, <laughs> right? I just had it happen to me the other day, and this has happened a lot of times. I was preaching, and um, the wife nudged the husband and said, see, he's talking to you. And see, she was telling me about it. I said, no, I was talking to you. Not, the Holy Spirit was talking to you. I wasn't pointing her out, but the Holy Spirit's talking to you. Tonight, what can you do to make changes, to put God first? What are, are there feelings or certain things that are coming up in your emotions that are, that are ruling, the, ruling the roost? Learn to put them down. Fear could be one, right? Jealousy could be another one. These things are not the Lord's will for our lives, right? And so look at verse 17. When the holy lovers of God cry out to him with all their hearts, the Lord will hear them and come to rescue them from all of, the, all of their troubles. Like I said, I believe that. And that's what I started saying. That I remind myself that if I stay humble, what does God say he'll do for the humble? He will lift them up. And so I say, God, I'll be humble. I'll control those emotions. I won't act on that will that wants to do something else. I'll control my will by the, by the Spirit of God within me to honor you. And you'll deal with it. You'll lift me up. You'll protect me. And you know what? He does. Look at verse 18. The Lord is close to all whose hearts are crushed by pain. And he is always ready to restore the repentant one. Even when bad things happen to the good and godly ones, the Lord will save them and not let them be defeated by what they face. God will be your bodyguard to protect you when trouble is near. Not one bone will be broken. Evil will cause the death of the wicked, for they hate and persecute the devoted lovers of God. Make no mistake about it, God will hold them guilty and punish them, and they will pay the penalty. But the Lord has paid for the freedom of his servants, and he will freely pardon those who love him. He will declare them free and innocent, and they will turn to hide themselves in him. Isn't that beautiful? This is what the, the word of God is meant to do. It's meant to be read and to be 
um, memorized and, and meditated on, that's a good word, meditated on, and let it get in your innermost being. So the Holy Spirit can take that word and, and, and use it to bring it to your remembrance and to balance your emotions and your will that wants to go against the will of God, you'll, you'll know a different way. You won't be on the road that leads to death and destruction. You won't be on that road. You'll be on the road of, of life. It's a good deal. I'm sure many of you have, have already used this before. When I was um, working at the tree service, I think I've told this story before. I've been here long enough, you get to hear stories multiple times. <laughs> and, uh, it was late, um, late in the day, and I, I pulled into the Chambersburg dump that's right across from the Stevens Elementary School, and, and there was this like uh, um, big metal things. They were, that's back when they were building the p treatment plant. That's how long ago it was over there. Water treatment plant, sewage plant. I, I didn't think of what was going on. I didn't do it on purpose, but I just blew right by that, and I kicked up a dust storm. Anybody that's ever been back there, you, when you drive through there and you look back, you, all you see is dust. And I kicked all kinds of dust up on, on their paint that they were doing. And um, so you know, I felt bad about it. But <laughs> um, in some ways, they could have made better precautions you know, I didn't know, but anyway, so I'm driving back out of the Chambersburg dump, and those guys were so mad at me, it was just me and my buddy, but he wasn't going to help me out much, anyway, and uh, they put a barrier on the road to stop me from getting through, and they, they wanted, they wanted uh, a show down at the OK Corral here, <laughs> and back in the day, believe it or not, I was pretty buff, I guess it was, I don't know, but I, I was in shape <laughs> and climb trees all day and lift logs. You're going you're gonna to be in some kind of a shape, right? And these guys blocked the road. And I'm thinking, what is that? How's that going to stop me? I just went around it in the grass. <laughs> and I just started going down the, down the road and I looked in my mirror. I shouldn't have looked in my mirror. In fact, I knew better. And I look in the mirror and some guy is back there, like, going all crazy, like, come on back, and, and flipping me the bird and doing all these things. And all of a sudden, I just stopped the truck. My emotions took over. The, the testosterone. I stopped the truck, and I thought, okay, what's his problem? Mind you now, I'm a single parent at this time with four children. If they don't have me, they don't have anyone. And I'm about ready to throw down. <laughs> so he, I thought, you know, he's, he might be, you know, I don't know what he's going to do. He was just a little guy, too. He wouldn't have been much of a challenge. I'm just saying that way. But anyway, but he was feisty. He comes running up there, and I thought, oh, my gosh, he's not stopping now what did I get myself into? And I, and I started to get out of the truck, then all of a sudden, right here, the spirit within my spirit said, don't do that. Don't do that. Why do you wanna do that? What's gonna happen from that? You know, your kids need you. All this stuff came rushing into me and it just like stopped me in my tracks. And he comes up to my door and he's like, you ran, you, you got our stuff all dusty. And I said, uh, and it just, I just completely changed by the power of the spirit. And I said, sir, I am completely sorry. I said, I, had, I didn't see it. I don't know what to tell you. I didn't see it. I'm sorry. And when I said that, he completely like, he didn't know what to do. Because I talked nice to him. Does the Bible say that that soft answer will turn away wrath? And just by this, and I believe by the anointing. I believe the anointing was there to calm everything down. And I said, I'm, I'm sorry. I said, next time I come up, I'll, be, uh, I'll make sure I drive slow. And he said, oh, okay, that's good. <laughs> and so, but in closing here, if, 
um, if you want to, turn over to um, uh, 1 Corinthians 13. I love this chapter. It's called the love chapter. There was a man that said that his family said that, that they felt like they had to walk on eggshells around him. He just was always in a bad mood, always temperamental. And he was praying about it. And the Lord said, I want you to read 1 Corinthians 13 three times a day. And he read it three times a day. And something changed in him. It completely took over his emotions and his will, his, his um, worldly will, and he became, a, he became kind and gentle just by the power of the Word of God. You think the Word can do that? Jesus said his Word is spirit and life. The Bible says in Hebrews 4.12 that the Word of God is sharp and powerful, more powerful than any two-edged sword, and it will pierce the, the soul and the spirit. It's a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. It will get right into your innermost being, your, your spiritual being, and it will be a foundation. And by that knowledge and by the presence of the Holy Spirit, you'll control your will. You'll control your emotions. You'll control your tongue. You'll control your mind. You need to control your minds. Do you know the mind is a supercomputer? And it's built by God to handle natural situations. Like if you're going across the street and it's a busy street, your mind will say, go or don't go. It'll keep you alive. It's like that game Frogger. Anybody ever remember that? You know, like your mind's built to figure it out naturally, but there are going to come, come times when your mind cannot figure it out because it's going to take a spiritual solution. That's when you have to renew your mind to what the Word of God says and discipline it to the, to the faith-filled words in the Bible and, and, and um, transform it. That takes work. It takes work. And it's not something you can say, well, I did, it for, I did it for a year and I'm good. Nope, because the next day you'll falter. You gotta renew your mind every day. And especially to areas that you feel that you need to work on the most. And so, look at 1 Corinthians 13. He says, Though I speak with the tongue of men and of angels, and have not love, I have become a sounding brass or a clanging cymbal. Can you imagine that? That's a terrible sound. I often say, you want me to do a demonstration? Do we got cymbals back here? No. What he's saying is, if I don't have love, you know what I sound like to God? Bang, bang, bang. Nothing. Nothing. Love's pretty important. Look at verse 2. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains, and if I don't have love, I'm nothing. Look at verse 3. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned, if I don't have love, it profits me nothing. Then it gives a beautiful description of love, what love is and what love isn't. It says, love suffers long and is kind. So let me just stop there. If you're going to love with the God kind of love, you're going to suffer long. What are you gonna, what's going to suffer? Your emotions that want to be validated. I'm not the only one. Love is kind. Love does not envy. Love does not parade itself. Love is not puffed up. Does not behave rudely. Does not seek its own. Love is not provoked. Thinks no evil. Does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Sounds to me like the love of God is pretty important. 
You can know all the Bible scriptures in the world and you can even have spiritual gifts and you can be super mega in those areas. But if you don't have love, it profits nothing. It'd be like having a bright, shiny um, Cadillac sitting in the driveway, but no gas. Because faith works by what? Love. So if, if, if the faith is the Cadillac, the love is the gas. If you don't have the love, you're sitting in the driveway waving to everybody going by. You're not going nowhere. You know how I know? Because the Bible tells me that. You know who I tell this to the most? Me. Because I can be a hardhead. I can, thank you. Leslie said no. <laughs> you got to get your, you got to preach to yourself too. Look at verse 8. Love never fails. So you know what? If I walk in love, I'm not going to fail. I'm not going to fail. If I humble myself, God's going to pick me up. Oh, my, will I have an overactive mind? What about this? What about that? And is my, is my emotions going to try to be unruly? Yeah. Will that ever stop? Will I ever stop having the flesh against the spirit? Will, I, will it ever stop? No. Paul said it didn't stop for him, <laughs> so it's not going to stop for us. But Paul told us how to overcome it by the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. We have the spirit of God in us, and he has set us free of the law of sin and death. God gives us strength, does he not? He said, but where there's prophecies, they will fail. Where there are tongues, they will cease. And where there is knowledge, it will vanish away. For we know in part and we prophesy in part. But when that which is perfect has come, then that which is in part will be done away. So we know these things in part. We have these giftings in part because we're still in the flesh. But when the perfect one comes, we're going to be doing away with these things. Right? Why? We'll be staring at Jesus face to face. The flesh will be removed. <laughs> And we'll have a glorified body uh, a, a new, after the new creation of, of, of God for us, right? We've already been created in the spirit. Now we're, one day we're going to have a new creation in the body. The body, the corruptible body will be incorruptible. The mortal body will be immortal. So look at verse 11. When I was a child, I spoke as a child. I understood as a child. I thought as a child, but when I became a man, I put away childish things. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then I shall know just as I also am known. And verse 13 says, and now abideth faith, hope, and love, these three. But the greatest of these is what? Love. Love. Love is the greatest. Jesus told the disciples in, in, before he went to the cross, the last prayer that he ever prayed, his, his sentiment was this, that the disciples would all be one as he and the Father are one. Remember that? And then he, he told them this. He said, by your love for one another, the world will, will, will see me. The, you'll, you'll shine and you'll show me. That's why the Bible puts such a reverence on churches and our conduct. And, and um, because when those things aren't in display, people get hurt, people get confused. Amen? We got to live our life is what if the person we come across is the last person that we'll ever well, the last person that, that, ever, that knows God that that person will ever see. They're not guaranteed tomorrow. You are. Did God promise you a long life? 
Did he? You're guaranteed it. They're not. I've learned a lot from, from Leslie because Leslie's more outgoing than me, in case you haven't noticed. And she just, just talks to people all the time. And, you know, I feel guilty sometimes because when we go into the grocery store together, I'm like, I want in and I want out. It doesn't work that way. Because Leslie will find somebody to compliment, which is good, and to talk to. And then I'm like, oh, boy, now I've got to talk. <laughs> Nothing against that person. That's that old... Um, uh, emotions and that old feelings that still tries. So you know what I do? I understand that she's my wife and she takes me this way. Guess what? I pull her this way. Amen? There's some areas that I help pull her to the center. She pulls me to the center. I don't resist that anymore. I want to challenge myself. And don't be such a non-talker. Right? <laughs> and we can look at it, you know what? I want to I wanna just show people love. Amen. And when I start, first started this journey with the Lord, I just started praying. I got to get back to this because you pray about all kinds of things. But I, the simple prayers of, a, of your very beginnings, try to remember what those prayers were like because they were pure. And you know what? I woke up every morning and I said, God, let me help somebody today. Bring someone across my path that I can help. And he did. One day I was working on a tree job and this guy was doing construction on the same property. So we were just sort of working together and he kept following me around. You know when someone's following you because you're standing there again. And finally I just thought, well, maybe this is someone that I prayed for. See, I got it finally. And uh, he starts right on the, right, right as soon as I stopped and gave him some time. You know what he said? Been diagnosed with a brain tumor. I don't have long to live. You know what he wanted? Prayer. How he sought me out? I wasn't even a preacher at the time. I don't know. But the, the dude was following me. Maybe he knew Cumberland Valley Tree Service was a Christian company or whatever. And you know what I did? Prayed for him right there. That's what love does. Amen? That's all I have. Would you rise, please? Thank you for coming out. So, remember in your prayers, always pray for your church. Always. Always pray for the people in your church. Always pray for the vision. Keep yourself sensitive and, and soft. Don't be hard-hearted on it. Because if the devil would want, if the devil would have his way, he's coming after your church. Or he's coming after your marriage. Or he's coming after something. And don't let him in, right? And the best way to do it is guard your own heart. And you pray and you seek the Lord and you say, you know what, I'm going to be a person of love and I'm going to build the people up in the church and I'm going to protect the people of the church and I'm going to let my light shine and I'm going to just get all involved in what God is doing and I'm going to believe, believe that God's going to do miracle signs and wonders. And we'll see more than what you could ever imagine. Amen? Let's pray. Father, I thank you for this time that we had tonight. And now, Lord, I just thank you for all these precious souls. I pray, Lord, that you watch over them. Lord, I, I pray that you keep them safe. I pray, Lord, that when they, they pray to you, that their, their minds are clear from all the clutter. And I pray, Lord, that they learn to just tap into the quiet, the, the quiet sweet spirit that is within them, Lord. And I pray, Father, that they just stay a while in your presence. I pray, Father, that when they pray to you that they, they're not in a rush. I pray that they didn't put you in a box of five minutes. I pray, Lord, that they don't just try to squeeze you in, 
I pray, Lord, including myself, that we make time for you. We give you holy time. We give you prime time. And we just rest in your presence. And as we do, Lord, you will clarify many things in our heart. You will strengthen us, Lord. For where the Spirit of the Lord is, there's liberty. So, Father, I just pray that we live that kind of life, not just on Wednesday or Sunday, every day. May we pursue you in that way. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.